Hello and welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 24th of August. Now I want to look at the uh, FDA full approval of the Pfizer vaccine basically today. Now we didn't anticipate this yesterday, um, quite a few people anticipated this yesterday and it was actually late, later in the day, my time, but I think it was 10 in the morning, uh, Eastern Standard Time. It was approved in the form of this press release so far. So not masses of information, more the official confirmation. Now what difference is this going to make? But well, I think what it means is that there'll be a lot more options and potential for uh, government bodies, transport bodies and employers to mandate this vaccine now in the States. It's now official and I think we're going to see more vaccine mandates. Like it or not, I think that is inevitable. But what about opinions and attitudes? Well, the Kaiser Family Foundation have looked at the people who've not yet been vaccinated and they found that about 30% of those would now be more likely to take the vaccine. Doesn't sound like a lot, but roll that out across all of the United States. And of course, that is a lot of people. And of course, there was another quite large group of people who were saying, well, I'll just wait and see what's going to happen. And amongst that wait and see group, about 50% are now more likely to take the vaccine. So this has got big national and indeed uh, international implications. This is quite a significant move, really. Let's look at some of the detail. Um, emergency use, use authorization was granted back on the 11th of December. So this has been a long time. About half the vaccine doses given out in the United States have been uh, Pfizer-BioNTech. So US Food and Drug Administration, formal approval. Uh, call me a natty, <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's the phonetics, call me a natty. So this is going to be called call me a natty. It's going to be marketed as call me a natty. Now, sounds a bit of a strange name to me, but I guess we'll get used to it. Call me a natty is now the, the approved version of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So make what you will of that. So approved for the prevention of COVID-19 disease in individuals 16 years of age and over. So this is after... 16 years and over. This is now FDA approved as Cormier Natty. Probably going to take me a while to remember that strange name. Um, continues to be available under emergency use authorization for 12 to 15 year olds and uh, emergency use authorization as a third dose for those immunocompromised, which of course that bit is certainly good. So I think it's only fair to let the uh, director or the acting director of the Centre for Disease Control have her say on this. So acting FDA di uh, commissioner, Janet Woodcock, medical doctor, of course. While this and other vaccines have met the FDA's rigorous scientific standards for emergency use authorization, as the first approved COVID-19 vaccine, the public can be very confident that this vaccine meets the high standards for safety, effectiveness and manufacturing quality the FDA requires as an approved product. So they're direct quotes from the uh, from the press release uh, and from uh, Janet Woodcock. So that sounds about what you'd expect her to say, of course. She also says that we recognise for some the FDA approval of a vaccine may now instill additional confidence to get vaccinated. Good, when th that, that's held out by that survey. Today's milestone puts us one step closer to altering the course of this pandemic in the United States. And I think that's probably true. Now, it's, it is a fairly exhaustive process. This. I don't understand it in full. I've done about half an hour to an hour's reading on it. But, you know, they'll do things like go and inspect the manufacturing facilities to make sure the manufacturing is up to scratch, as well as looking at all the data. I think this is why there's a delay in the Novavax protein vaccine. It's not the science. It's not the empirical data. It's not the efficacy. It's not the safety profile. It's the physical manufacturing process, how you actually make this thing that's being being um, causing the difficulty there. But obviously with Pfizer, that's all been approved now, which is uh, interesting. Uh, um, FDA, back to the FDA statement, the messenger RNA, ribonucleic acid in uh, Cormanati, <laughs> is only present in the body for a short time and is not incorporated, nor does it alter an individual's genetic material. Definitive statement. So now you can object to this vaccine if you like. Of course, many do, and, and that's there's a there's an argument to be had. But it's now no longer reasonable to say that giving an mRNA vaccine alters my DNA. It does not. These vaccines, they will generate the 
that the mRNA will generate the spike protein in our cells, but the mRNA itself will only be there for a relatively short period of time. I think probably about 12 to 24 hours, that kind of time. It does not incorporate into the DNA as, for example, HIV does. It's not like that. So use whatever argument you can back up, but don't let anyone say this alters my DNA. It doesn't. So that is, uh, that is now definitive. Uh, Cormac, Cormac Natty has the same formulation as the emergency use authorization Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and is administered as a series of two doses three weeks apart. Now this surprised me. I thought they would take the opportunity to increase the gap between doses. Not so much because it improves the short-term efficacy of the vaccine but because there's data that suggests it might in increase the longevity of the vaccine but they, ha they haven't so Fair enough, that, that, that's still where we are at, three weeks apart. The analysed effectiveness data from about uh, 20,000 people that were vaccined, uh, vaccinated and 20,000 people who received a placebo and they compared the 20,000 in the vaccine group with the 20,000 in the placebo group to get this data. So essentially it's a bit of a, a, another clinical trial really. And of course, I think it's safe to assume they were looking at the, the many millions of doses that were given out as well on a continuing monitoring basis. Now, they say vaccine was 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 disease. Now, I really don't know how much of that was in the Delta variant time period. And the reason I don't know is because the report simply doesn't say. Uh, I read through the report pretty carefully. I didn't see it. If you can find it, then do let me know. But um, it just doesn't say. So I suspect part of that data is alpha variant data. I would expect it to be slightly less efficacious at preventing COVID-19 symptomatic disease in, uh, in Delta variant. But that is released yesterday. So maybe that's right. You know, that is uh, that, that could be based on more up to date data than we have at our disposal at the moment. This is the press release from yesterday. Safety, approximately 12,000 recipients have been followed up for at least six months. Now, this is there are things that concern me about short term vaccine side effects. And of course, we're going to be looking at the heart inflammation with the Pfizer in a minute. But what I don't think will happen is that everything will be fine for four or five months. And then all of a sudden you'll get a complication. I really can't see any reason why that should happen. The complications that we know about are occurring shortly after the vaccine or shortly after the second dose. I really can't think of any vaccines that are likely to cause problems years and years in the future. That that would be, well, it can ha it can happen. I mean, measles virus can cause very rare conditions that can then affect the brain. But th these are remarkably rare, really remarkably, remarkably rare. Most doctors and nurses will go their whole career and never, never see such a case. So anyway, so this has been followed up for six months and I personally find that reassuring. It happened, I had the Pfizer vaccine, so um, I'm, I'm reassured by that. That's just the way it fell, I didn't plan it, it's just the way it worked out. So following up for six months, and of course they're carrying on following those up and they're going to be following them up for a long time into the future. Now, the most common reported side effects, as we know, but it's confirmed in this report, pain, redness, swelling at the site of injection, pretty transitory. Really nothing, nothing to worry about. That's simply not an issue in most people. Fatigue, headaches, muscle, joint, pain, chills and fever for some time um, in some people. Um, Again, more so after the second dose with the, with the Pfizer vaccine, that tends to occur. But again, transitory, self-limiting. This is just the body's reaction to the foreign uh, spike protein material. And it's just the body. It's just, really, it just means the body's mounting the immune defense. So in a, in a way, you could say it's probably a good thing that you get those, those adverse events. And they, 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 they pass pretty quickly. Now, the... FDA is saying there's been rigorous evaluation of the post-authorization safety surveillance data. So this is the post-authorization for emergency use safety surveillance data. In other words, they've been following this up now since December the 11th um, last year. So they've collected quite a bit of data. Of course, it only was used in younger people uh, more recently than that. Uh, myocarditis is inflammation of the myocardium. Itis is just inflammation of pericarditis, the layer around the heart. We've looked at this before. The heart has a muscular layer called the myocardium. 
thick muscle layer called the myocardium, the contractile part, the muscle. Round about that there's a tough fibrous membrane called the pericardium. Inflammation of the outside layer is the pericardium. Inside, uh, inflammation of the muscular layer is, is myocarditis, so pericarditis and myocarditis. We know that these occur. Now, um, one slightly frustrating thing on, on this report was it didn't give any numbers on this. It was just sort of left hanging there, which I found very frustrating. So what I did was I went back to the last time that we actually had positive data on this. Again, uh, we, we did report on this at the time from this, this report here. But this goes back to June 2021. But they had been monitoring the data for, uh, for some time. Um, this was published actually in July, but that was the time they... Uh, they were monitoring the data through and we, look, we looked at this in quite a lot of detail at the time so I'm not going to do it in great detail now but that the point is this is the last um, quantitative information we have uh, information we have on the numbers the current report is not giving numbers I'm expecting them to be out pretty soon but they're not out yet so a bit I was a bit disappointed on that read I did expect I was expecting a bit more to be quite honest Anyway, let's, let's just do a bit of parenthesis now to talk about this. Now, this isn't in the report, but we have looked at chest pain, shortness of breath, feeling of having a fast beating or fluttering or a pounding heart um, as potential features of pericarditis or myocarditis. So they will be the features to look out for. That's the reference that we looked at. Now, in this second report here, it, um, there's a lot of, it's pretty dense with, uh, with data, this actually, this report. Um, but um, I did, I've looked through it quite thoroughly and um, it seems that um, in the time period studied, this is up to June, 52 million doses of vaccine were given to 12 to 29 year olds. So 12 to 29 year olds had 52 million doses of uh, a vaccine. Now, this was both of the mRNA vaccines, from what I remember. Use of an mRNA vaccine, yes. So uh, vaccine reports after myocarditis. So that could have been the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. So this, but, this, but of course, this still certainly applies to the, the Pfizer. But looking at both of the mRNA vaccines, 52 million doses given out in 12 to 29 year olds. In that 52 million doses, 1,226 reports of myocarditis after an mRNA vaccine. So um, I worked that out as one in 42,414. So 1,226 cases of myocarditis or indeed pericarditis, 52 million doses of the vaccine in that age group. So that gives you kind of a, an insight into the um, commonness or rarity, depending on the way you want to phrase it, of this, of this side effect which is the only significant side effect we've had reported on really for the mRNA vaccines, the only one that would be really concerning. Data demonstrates increased risk, particularly within the seven days following the second dose. So this is back to the report now. This is the current report. Uh, data demonstrate increased risk, particularly within seven days following the second dose. This is most likely to occur. Few cases after the first dose. The, the cases, the times where it occurred after the first dose, the people have probably been exposed to the actual virus already. In people that haven't been exposed to the virus already, it happens after the, or much more likely to happen, after the second dose. The observed risk is higher amongst males under 40 years of age compared to females and uh, older males. So younger men are those most at risk, more so than females, more so than older men. They are the risk group. Risk is highest in males 12 through 17 years of age. So 12 to 17 year old young men, teenagers, whatever you want to call them, are most at risk. Now, again, one thing I was slightly disappointed in here is we know that the, the um, vaccines like the, um, the uh, Oxford vaccine or the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine are based on adenovirus vectors. And the, the, the problem with those is not myocarditis or pericarditis. They can cause uh, blood clots. Um, this unusual form of uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, low platelets with thrombosis. But that's more common in, in females. That's more common in females. So what I haven't seen is an analysis between giving this to, say, male teenagers and how safe it would be to give them an mRNA vaccine. 
that would be interesting. So young women, of course, you wouldn't want to give uh, you wouldn't want to give a, an adenovirus vector vaccine too because of the risk of this thrombosis and thrombocytopenia but what is the risk in young men compared to the messenger rna viruses uh, vaccines compared to the messenger rna vaccines like the pfizer and moderna they don't say so really i think that's another omission that that cross comparison uh, between the risk profile of both vaccines so it, it may be it may be that the the anson johnson and johnson or the vaccine or, or the um the Anson Johnson and Johnson or the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine would be more suitable for this age group. We need that analysis to tell us where where the risk is lowest, and it wasn't there. Anyway, back to the, um, the Pfizer short term follow up suggests that most individuals have had resolution of symptoms. So the cases where there was heart inflammation, the pericarditis or the myocarditis, um, most individuals again not quantified saying basically the most the majority had resolution of symptoms in other words they got better some individuals did require uh, intensive care support for a period of time now there was no mention of any deaths i don't think i've heard of any deaths from this um, but we only know what we know from this report information is not yet available about potential long-term health outcomes so yeah most individuals it was a short condition a few did require intensive care, but how many were left with a longer term problem was simply not told. But just a reminder of the context from this previous paper, that's the sort of numbers we're talking about. 1,226 cases reported after 52 million vaccinations. But read that paper for yourself. I've included all the, um, I've included all the links, of course. So that's the information on that. FDA and CDC monitoring systems in place for early detection of any future complications that may arise. And of course, ongoing monitoring of this now recognised side effect. Pfizer agreed to conduct post-marketing studies to further assess the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis, as indeed we would expect the, uh, the FDA to be doing as well including evaluation of long-term outcomes, which we really don't know what they are yet. Um, and they're also going to conduct a pregnancy registry study to evaluate pregnancy and infant outcomes after vaccination during pregnancy. Current advice, of course, is to give it, but again, longer-term follow-up is going to be instigated there. So I think we'll leave that there. Um, basically good news and of course they are the, the vaccines are being very very strongly recommended by the fda and the uh, and, and indeed the cdc so that is where we are up to with the approval of the pfizer bioentech vaccine and uh, thank you for watching